All right, good morning, Ridge Point Church. How are you doing this morning? Good. Man, we're glad that you're here. Let's try that one more time. I think we have more energy than that. How are you doing this morning? <laughs> I like the woo. That's nice this morning. Uh, listen, turn to the person next to you, give them a fist bump, and say, I'm glad to see you this morning. Man, I, we have a lot, a lot to be excited about this morning. Uh, first of all, we had baptism to start off the service. We're really excited about that. One of the things we love as a church is to help people take their next steps. And whether that next step is giving your life to Jesus or, or following him in baptism or getting plugged into a group or, or joining the church, there's a lot of next steps. And, and one of our goals is to help you take those easy, uh, obvious, and strategic next steps. Uh, so anything that we can do to help you take those next steps, please let us know. That's one of the best resources to be able to use our connection card. If you say, yes, I want to be able to do that. Just mark that card and someone will follow up with you. Uh, we want to help people take next steps. So we're excited about that, but we're also equally as excited to see the pictures from our student trip last night. Uh, one of the things that kind of is at the core of what we do as a church is just this idea of service. Uh, we have been, uh, a team of us have been down in Honduras for the past week. I promise you, we are still processing through all the stuff that happened in the past week. In a couple of weeks, we'll be able to share a little bit more about that. Uh, but just an incredible, incredible week for us. Uh, and, and then as we're processing through that, some of the people that were on the team are also youth leaders. And other leaders and students went yesterday to serve. And, and we believe that at the core of what we do, if we're going to actually exemplify who Jesus was and, and how he acted was to serve the people around us, whether it's here in our own Jerusalem or literally across the world. So I'm excited to see our students kind of following up in that and, and being a part of that. So we're excited about those things. We also have some things coming up. We're looking at a future build with Habitat for Humanity. So maybe if you weren't able to go to Honduras but want to get your building skills put to, te put to the test, uh, we're working on getting that worked out here very shortly. And also in a couple of weeks, we're going to share something brand new happening here at Ridgepoint Church. You might have heard some rumblings about it. Uh, but we're excited about the chance we have to serve our community and to literally be the hands and feet of Jesus. But today we get a chance to go back into the book of Philippians. Uh, if you've been with us since the beginning of the summer, we've been kind of walking through uh, the book of Philippians. We took a little bit of a break as the fall semester hit. We started talking about some groups stuff. But Philippians happens to be, we didn't plan it out for this reason, but Philippians happens to be my favorite book. It's really a letter uh, that was written from the Apostle Paul to the early churches in the city of Philippi. And, and the reason why I love this letter so much is a lot of times what happens is Paul goes on these missionary journeys and he plants churches and, and he stays there for a little bit, builds up the leadership, then he leaves to go to the next town and, and lets the leadership start to lead. But every once in a while, he'd get a report of, of some things that were going well and maybe some things that were some challenges. And he'd write a letter back, and sometimes it required another visit. But he'd write a letter back and say, hey, here's some things that I feel like I need to address. Philippians, we're actually going to get a little bit of that today, but really mostly Philippians isn't necessarily that. Most of Philippians is this joyous expression of saying, man, church, I thank you so much for the way you've gravitated towards the mission. You're continuing to do the work. But also as Paul travels the city of Philippi, the church at Philippians, is one of the few churches that actually kind of supports him in what he's doing. So Paul's writing this just saying, hey, thank you so much. I love the work that you're doing. Thanks for being partners with us from the very beginning. And as we continue to go forward, I want to continue to encourage you. And that might be why I love this letter so much, because I look at my role as a pastor to be that of an encourager, an exhorter. And so I read this, and I'm like, man, I love Paul when he's, when he's like this, because he's such an encourager. That being said, as much as most of this is a, a letter of encouragement, he does have some teaching. And especially as we get into chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, he begins to give some teaching in two separate areas that we're going to tackle this morning. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read this entire section together, then we're going to come back and talk about it a little bit. So if you have your Bibles open to Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, we'll read down through verse 7. And it says this, I entreat you, Odiot, I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true companions, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. And then he says this, kind of changing his thought a little bit. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. 
The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Really, there's, there's two thoughts we're going to talk about this morning. We'll tackle the first, but then I really want to talk about this topic of, he says towards the latter part of this, he says, don't be anxious. Do not be anxious about anything. I want to tackle the topic of being anxious. Not, not necessarily anxiety, though I'll reference the word anxiety, but really this idea where Paul says this, and Jesus actually said this earlier when he was teaching. He says, do not be anxious. And I have two questions for us this morning, two really important questions. And I don't want you necessarily to answer out loud or raise your hands, but just to think about these questions. The number one question is this, do you feel more anxious today than you did five years ago? Just think about that for a second. Do you feel more anxious today than you did five years ago? And the second question is this one. Do you feel like our country is more anxious today than it was five years ago? Now, maybe you've already thought through the topic of, because it seems like this is an epidemic. We'll talk about that in a second. So maybe you've already thought through this, but, but in my life, when I started to think about these two questions, I would say yes and yes. If you answered yes to the first question, know that you're not alone. And if you answered yes to the second question, the numbers bear out that that is accurate. In fact, in 2017, the American Psychiatric Association did a study where they asked a question of of adults living in the United States, of of adults and teenagers living in the United States. Uh, How many of you feel very anxious or somewhat anxious about and asked a bunch like your finances, your health, all these different things? 66%, two-thirds of the people polled say, yes, I feel either very anxious or somewhat anxious about those things. 66%, two-thirds. A year later, they took a similar poll asking the very same question, and the number had risen by 5%. 71% of people said, yes, that's where I'm at right now. And it seems like there's this this rise of anxiety. There's this rise of, of just people feeling anxious And probably one of the most fascinating things about this particular study, really two fascinating things. One was this. The numbers are rising quickest among the younger people of our generation. The millennial generation and younger is becoming more and more anxious. This used to be something that was reserved for people who were adults who had a lot of responsibility. They said, I got to take care of my family, I got to take care of the bills. And so, with that, there's this rise of, of anxiety. But they saw the numbers getting much, much, much larger, but especially on people who are much and much, 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 much younger. They said they're starting to see this rise of young people, millennial generation and younger, who are feeling high levels of anxiety. So, they started to ask a question. Why is that? Why do we feel like the anxiety is starting to become so prominent, especially among people that were younger? And there were a couple of different studies that were done, and they said, we can't really tell why, but some was attributed to diet. Some was attributed to sleeping habits. Some of it was just because of the pressure they're facing, the rise of school shootings, the divisiveness that seems to be separating our country. All of those things seem to be a little bit of a contributor to this rise of anxiety. But the one thing that every one of the studies cited was the rise of social media. Students are dealing with the pressure of, I'm seeing what all my friends are doing, and and I want to be just like that. And it isn't just students. We as adults do that. We see pictures of people on vacation, and we see just a small snapshot of what seems like a perfect life. And their life isn't perfect, but we see it, and we think, man, if my life was just like that, everything would be great. That's not the real life. But we all have a tendency to do that. And so the easy solution would be, okay, well then let's just get rid of social media altogether and the problem has gone. Except I got news for us. Social media isn't going away. Facebook isn't going to die tomorrow no, how much, no, no matter how much anxiety is going up. It isn't going away. So we have to come up with a better remedy to all of this. You see, for a lot of us, anxiety is like this. We wake up in the morning, we pick up a backpack that's full of heaviness and we put that backpack on and we wear it throughout the day and no matter where we go we've put a 
50 or 100 pound weight in our backpack. And no matter where we go throughout the day, even as we start to think about other items, that backpack goes with us. And we feel the weight of that anxiety. We feel that weight of that anxiousness so much so that even when we're not dealing with that particular thing, whatever it is that's bringing our anxiety, even when we're not thinking about that and focusing on that particular thing, we still feel the weight of it. Not talking necessarily about people who have like clinical anxiety, but people who just, man, it seems like this thing in my life, I can't get away from it. I have to figure this out. And that anxiousness that comes with it, even when I'm not focused on the topic, it feels like the heaviness is with me, that I'm carrying that with me wherever I go. And at first, it doesn't seem that debilitating. At first, I can put 25 or 50 pounds on my back, and, and I'm a big, strong guy. I can handle that. But if I wear this backpack long enough, eventually the, the, the back muscles start to get a little bit tired. I feel like I want to stretch my neck a little bit, and it starts to get sore. And, and we live with that, that stress, that anxiety, that, that worry. And then Jesus comes in, and Jesus has this teaching where he says, do not be anxious. And by the way, the teaching where Jesus gives that teaching in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, he says, don't be anxious about the very things that we're anxious about today. He says things like, don't be anxious about your appearance. Don't be anxious about your health. Don't be anxious about your food. All these things that we're anxious about today, they were things they were anxious about 2,000 years ago. That part of it hasn't changed. So Jesus comes and says, don't be anxious. And that seems a lot easier said than done. And then we pick up Philippians chapter 4, and Paul's writing to the early church. And the third of the three commands that he gives at the latter part of what we read is a command to not be anxious. And if you've ever been there before, if you've ever been there where that, that weight is on you, and you say, listen, Paul, I want to take this weight off. I just, I just don't know how to do that. Like, I'm not walking around like I want to be anxious. I don't think there's anybody who walks around saying, man, I really hope I'm anxious tomorrow. That doesn't happen. But most of us, at least 71% of us say, but I feel that all the time. I feel like I'm walking around with this heavy weight that I just can't escape. And the longer I carry it, the, the more tired I become. Well, the great thing is Paul doesn't just leave us with his admonition to not be anxious. It's actually, like I said, the third of three commands that he gives. We're going to get into that. I want to comment, though, on the beginning of what I read. Philippians chapter 4, he begins by kind of his, he's really getting into the closing of this book. It's four chapters, and he's getting towards the end. And so a lot of what he does towards the end, Paul wrote a lot of letters in the New Testament. A lot of times at the end of those letters, he writes some personal notes. And so he writes to these two ladies named Yodia and Syntyche. And, and it's interesting, two things I want to note about that is he says, listen, they have been with me. Help these women who've labored side by side with me in the gospel together. One of the things I love, and I've been talking about this for the last couple of years, is that when Jesus comes, he comes into a culture that is vastly different from ours. And in Jesus' culture, uh, women weren't allowed to be like co-laborers with men in anything. Their, their opinion wasn't valued. They were kind of viewed as, as lower in, in, in the hierarchy and lower in importance than men. And, and Jesus comes, and Jesus starts to lift them up, and he begins to empower them. Even so much so that if, if there was ever a, a trial and, and a woman was to testify, uh, her testimony wasn't going to be considered of value and it definitely wasn't of equal weight as a man's testimony. And yet when Jesus comes, it's by no accident that God, in the way that he chose for the orchestration of things to happen, when Jesus is resurrected from the dead, the first two people who encounter the resurrection of Jesus and who run with the testimony are what? They're women. Jesus is empowering them and saying, listen, they're co-laborers. They are just as important. And Paul writes that about Yodi and Syntyche. He says, listen, they've been with me from working side by side with me in the gospel together. And yet as they've been with me, it seems like there's been this, this disagreement among them. He doesn't list what the disagreement is. He just says that for whatever reason, they're not in agreement. And he says, I entreat or I urge these two women to agree in the Lord about this thing. And he says, but I also ask you to companion, who he's writing to, 
to help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers who names are in the book of life. He says, listen, and this is such a valuable, valuable tool for us to take. He says, listen, some division has risen between them. We don't know what it was. But he says, what they need right now is a mediator. Right now, they're both good people. They both want good things, but there's this disagreement. And so he urges a mediator to come in, someone with spiritual maturity to come in and say, when there's division between two people who are strong in their faith, our response should not be what we often do in our society. If I don't agree with you, well, then you're my enemy, and I'm going to turn my back on you. And he says, listen, that's not what I want. In fact, the best thing that could happen right here is for somebody with maturity, because I believe they're both good people, and I believe they both want the right thing. So someone with maturity must come in and act as a mediator to help them figure this thing out. And so he says, I hope that they agree, and I urge one of you to step in and help be that mediator. And then it's almost as quickly as he brings that up, he says, okay, I assume you guys are going to figure that out, so I'm going to move on to something else. And he begins with three different commands. The first two commands are positive, and that he tells them, hey, go and do this. The third one, which you already referenced, is a negative one that he says, don't be anxious. But the first two, I believe, were on a path towards this topic of being anxious and having anxiety. And so he says, we're going to get there, but before we get there, I want to lay the foundation for where we're going. And he begins with this command, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he does this. He says, just in case you missed that, because you're reading this letter, and sometimes, sometimes like it is we're in church, we're kind of listening, and then our mind wanders off for a second. And so Paul says, and by the way, again, I'm going to tell you this, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And then he says, again, I will say this, rejoice. Now, he doesn't say, because here's what you and I do. He doesn't say, rejoice when the getting is good. He doesn't say, rejoice when things are going your way. He says simply rejoice in the Lord always, regardless of your situation is good or bad. I believe he knew the topic of anxiety was about to come up. So he says, listen, if you want to combat it, here's how we have to face this difficult topic. Begin with a proper perspective on what's really valuable in life. Regardless of whether the situation right then dictates it, you begin with a rejoice. This past week as we were in Honduras, one of the things that struck everybody on the trip, but I think especially for the handful of people who were there for the first time, was that you walk into a situation where people have way, way, way less than we have right now. You walk in a situation where, especially in the neighborhood that we are working, uh, it, it it was rough. It's probably the roughest neighborhood that we've ever been in. And yet you see among the people, especially who were able to come down to the school we were working at called Afe, especially for the people that were there, there was this joy. Paul writes to the church at Philippi, the key word for Philippians is the word joy. And he has this topic come up over and over and over again. And so Paul writing to the church says, hey, here's, here's the solution to all of this. It begins with your demeanor. It begins with the way that you approach life. He says, here's how you do that. Begin with rejoicing. Unless you miss this, I want, to, I want you to get this. Again, I'm going to say it, rejoice. The first command is a command to rejoice. And then he says this. Let your reasonable, reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Now, if you have a different translation, it might have a different word there for reasonableness. That's kind of a a unique word. We don't use that very often. Some translations there kind of use the word gentleness. Actually, sometimes what happens when you're translating from one language to another, the Bible was originally written in the Greek language. When you translate from one language to another, sometimes there isn't a like one word that really carries the same weight in one language as it does the other. And so this word is one of those words that there's not exact English equivalent for it. So some translate it reasonableness, others translate it gentleness. But the idea is always be willing to sacrifice yourself. 
be willing to say, I want to look out for the other person. And so with that, there has to be reasonableness. With this, there, there has to be gentleness. As he's approaching this topic of anxiety, he begins by saying, if you want to have a proper perspective, if you want to remove anxiety from your life, it begins with having this attitude, this characteristic of saying, man, even when things are tough, I want to rejoice. Because when I'm rejoicing, I'm looking out for the good in my life. And the reality is, when I pick up the weight of the burden of life, when I do that, I'm making myself out to be in control. Listen to me for a second. There's only one person in control, and it's not you. And as soon as we take that weight off, listen, my backpack's not that heavy, but as I wear this throughout the sermon, it's getting heavier. And so at some point, I'm going to take that weight off, and it's going to feel extremely liberating. Well, for some of us, the reason why we struggle with anxiety is because we lifted that, we hoisted that backpack up ourselves. And we think, man, I have to be the one that's in control. And as long as I have to be the one that's in control, I have to watch out for myself and my own. And that leaves us very unreasonable. That leaves us very ungentle, leaves us very unchristlike. Because if I'm in control, then I have to make sure that my needs are being met. And then I get on social media, and I see people vacationing in Hawaii. I'm thinking, well, I can't that be me? Or I see people that are living in these big, huge houses, and I think, well, why can't that be me? And I see people driving that new car, that new truck, and I think, why can't that be me? And I make myself out to be the God of my life, and, and I run with that, and I start to bear the burden of that all by myself. And it feels debilitating. It feels heavy. And so Paul writing says, let your reasonableness, let your gentleness, let your self-sacrificing way be prevalent, be known to all people. And then he says this at the end. You might have missed this, but at the end of that verse, he says this. The Lord is at hand. When I first read that, I thought that's a peculiar place to put that part of the verse. Like the first part makes sense. Let your reasonableness, let your gentleness be, be known to everyone. But then it says the Lord is at hand. And I thought, man, that's such a unique spot to put that. But what he was saying was this. The Lord Jesus himself is, is here. Like he, he's aware there's accountability. He's watching. And by the way, when we talk about reasonableness, when we talk about gentleness, when we talk about self-sacrificing, he showed us the example. So for accountability and also for example's purposes, he says the Lord is right here. He's watching and he's encouraging us to have the same type of love that he had, to have the same characteristic that he had. You see, when I'm looking out for other people, it's hard to be anxious about my lot in life. When I'm being gentle, when I'm being reasonable, it's hard to be anxious about my spot in life. A few years ago, I was a youth pastor at a church prior to being here at Ridgepoint, and uh, we were on a, a, a youth camp trip, and, and, and we left to go. We had, there was three different churches that had gone together. We had three giant charter buses. We thought we were living the high life. We actually had charter buses to go on. We weren't riding in school buses. We actually had this thing known as air conditioning in our buses, which was amazing, until we started to drive home. And the bus that our youth group was in had the AC die on them. And we're driving the game, and we spent a lot of money to get these buses. And now we're driving, there's no AC. It's not like a school bus where you put the windows down. These windows are like long windows, and it's getting really, really hot. And remember about halfway through the trip, it's getting really hot as morning had kind of set and the sun's coming out. It's getting hotter and hotter. And the bus driver pulls over and he says, there's nothing we can do. The condenser's locked up. We got to press on. And so we did the best that we could do. And, and what I loved was that our youth group said, we want to have the mark of being gentle. And so we either could grumble and complain and get anxious about it or we could laugh about it. And our youth group responded and they started laughing about it for a little bit at least. The other youth pastors came up and like, dude, if this is our youth group, they'd be complaining. We'd have gotten off the bus by now. And we're just making jokes. We got Chick-fil-A giving us some ice packs, and we're trying to stay cool. And, and we, get, we got to a certain point in the trip, and we're driving, and it's, it's our bus again. We have no AC already. We're kind of laughing, but it's getting hotter. Or, or we're getting a little frustrated. And then all of a sudden, the most horrendous noise I've ever heard in any vehicle happened. 
I thought the air conditioning fell out of our truck, out of the bus. Um, but it didn't. We got, a, we got a flat tire on the side of the road. So we're like, well, okay, strike two. So we pull over, and the, one of the other youth pastors came. And now we're on the side of the road, no AC. The, the, the bus is running, so there's no airflow. It's getting really, really hot. And one of the other youth pastors comes on our bus. We can't get off because we're living on, on, a, on the side of I-75. The bus driver's out checking out what's going on. And the, and the other youth pastor gets on, and, he's like, and he says, guys, I'm so sorry this is happening to you as well. But he's like, listen, you had a bad blowout. It's better to be safe than sorry. I know it's rough, but just be, be happy with where you're at. No sooner does he say it's safer for us to be right there than the bus driver gets on the bus. He's like, you know what? We're going to press on. And Ben turned and said, never mind. <laughs> Y'all go ahead. We go a little further, and for the third time that day, we had another breakdown on our bus. The other buses are fine. It kept happening to us, and our response was either we're going to be gentle and reasonable about it, or we're going to grumble and complain, and the anxiety was going to get higher and higher. No matter what the situation is, if our response is to say we're going to rejoice in the midst of our suffering, we're also going to rejoice when the good things are happening. If we say we're going to let our reasonableness be known to everyone, that we're going to be gentle because we know that in doing that we get the picture of who Jesus is, then he gets to the final command where he says this, Do not be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And watch this, because this is what we long for. How do we do that? How do we get to the spot of getting rid of our anxiousness so that we're not anxious? He says this, you want to replace it with this. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He says what happens right now is if we're battling anxiety, it's because you don't have on the flip side of that is the peace of God that passes all understanding that's supposed to guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So we have a a responsibility in our life to choose between, am I going to live this this anxious life? Am I going to live where I constantly walk around filled with worry, filled with anxiety, filled with fear? Or am I going to choose to say, God, I'm going to trust you in the midst of the situations that I don't understand because I'm tired of picking up the backpack of control in my own life. And so, God, I'm going to choose this right here. I'm going to choose the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding Which is meant to, that peace of God is meant to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So practically speaking, how do I do that? Because here's what I want to do right now. I want to take the backpack off. I want to stop trying to bear that weight alone because that's what anxiety feels like. Man. Man. Just having that backpack on and these lights for 20 minutes. My back is sweating. My shoulders are tired. And yet we walk around like that emotionally and spiritually for most of our lives. Paul writes and says back in verse 6. Let's go back and look at that verse. He says this. Don't be anxious. But in place of the anxiousness, in place of the anxiety... He says this, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The remedy to my anxiety, the remedy to my fear is to realize, JJ, you're not the one who's in control. God is. And so when we approach him, we approach him saying, he says this, he says three different words. He uses three different words, all very similar, but a little bit different. He says, in place of anxiousness, we replace that anxiousness with prayer, with a conversation with God. God, I need to know that I'm not in this whole thing alone. And so, God, I want to have a conversation with you. So I begin with just a a prayer, that that dialogue with God. And part of that prayer is I come to him with, with supplication. Supplication is not a word we use very often. But supplication is this idea that I'm going to humbly bend my knee before God, saying, God, I'm not in control, but I believe that you are. And so I'm going to humbly bow my knee before you and ask for you to provide for me. It's a type of prayer, but it's a very specific type of prayer where I say, the first one is me having a conversation with God. The second one is me saying, God, I can't control the situation. And because I can't control the situation, I'm going to lean on you because I believe you're absolutely in control. 
and I'm going to humbly bow my knee before you and ask for you to intercede in this situation. And when you do the third part of that, the third prayer is I'm going to come to you with thanksgiving as well. That if I do that, if I say, man, instead of me being anxious, literally I'm going to start to come to God and say, God, I need to know that you're there. I need to realize you're God and I'm not, that I can't take care of the situation, but you can. And I'm going to have supplication before you. And when I see you work, whether or not it's the way that I want you to work, I'm going to come to you with this gratefulness, with this thanksgiving. That I'm able to have the remedy for my anxiety by saying, God, I, I want to trust you. God, I want to know that you're in control. Here's the problem. And here's why I think most of us have a hard time defeating this issue called anxiety is because all of us are really rushed. In fact, if I were to ask a question this morning, how many of you this morning are not rushed? I might get a couple of hands. <laughs> Kevin's back there saying, that's where I'm at. But, but there's not a lot of other people who would say, yeah, I'm not rushed. Most of us are very rushed. And so what happens is that backpack that is anxiety is sitting there. And I set it down and I said, you know what? I know that I should stop worrying, worry less and, and pray more. Like that makes sense to me and I probably already knew that. So why don't we do it? See, I, I genuinely believe that the God who is peace wants us to have peace. Like I, I genuinely believe that's what God wants for us. The God who himself is peace. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. The God who is peace wants us to be at peace. And we say, well, I know that I should worry more and pray less. Like I've seen that on t-shirts, on bumper stickers. I get all of that. But, but here's what happens. Is here's why we often feel that. It's because we know that and we face these, these situations in our life where it feels like it's beyond our control. And we go and we pray about it. But man, if our prayer isn't answered just like that, if right away, if, if, if I have spent 20 years getting myself in trouble on some issue, I'm going to give God 20 minutes to provide an answer. And if not, here's what I do. I pick the backpack up and I start worrying all over again. I say, God, I tried praying about it. Like, God, I spent, I spent 20 whole minutes talking about that topic. And God, in 20 minutes, I didn't feel any freer. And so I went ahead and I picked that thing back up and I started worrying about it again. God says, you got to take that backpack off and you got to throw that backpack away. As nice a backpack as that is, Alan Johnson. <laughs> you got to take that backpack off and you got to throw that backpack away because the worry is holding you back from absolutely living freely. The worry, listen, we just sang a song that talked about fear and depression, those things have to bow in our life. Shame and confusion, those things have to bow in our life. But we keep putting them up in a prominent position and saying, I'm going to keep going back to those things because I gave God 20 minutes and that was, that was enough. And now I'm back to shame. I'm back to fear. I'm back to anxiety. I'm back to worry. And God says, man, you need to get rid of those things altogether and trust me. Sometimes it's easier to do in a situation that we're not in control of at all. I love when we go on trips like we just went on. And I love seeing them. Alan and I were talking about this. The other Alan, Alan Tack and I were talking about this. But we love to see them through the eyes of people who have never been on a trip before. Because when you first land, regardless of how many times you've been down there, there's a little bit of culture shock. You land and... and Community is different and life is different and everything seems a little bit crazy. But after a couple of days, that confusion's gone. And I was asking Rachel and Jameson, who went for the first time on the trip, we were riding in the back of the van one of the days. And I said, How has your perspective in a couple of days changed? And their response is like most of our responses. Man, when we first came, they seemed a little bit hectic, a little bit crazy. But we also realized that. <clears throat> Here, we don't speak the language. We don't know the roads. We don't have access to a vehicle. This is totally beyond anything we're in control of. And somehow there was a, a peace, a divine peace, like it talked about in verse 7, that overcame that group, as it always does. When we're not in control, we're forced to let the backpack down. 
I can't worry about things that I'm not in control of. The best thing we could do is to say, whatever weights are holding us down, whatever things are, are holding us back, to say, God, as best I can, every day, I'm going to pray a prayer of getting rid of this stuff and relegating it to the corner of my life, to the closet of my life that I'm not going back to. And I'm going to leave it there. And every day I'm going to pray a prayer over and over saying, God, I remove that, that worry, that anxiety from my life. And God, I trust you more now than I did yesterday. And as I continue down that path, I trust you more tomorrow than I do today. Because by doing that, I'm saying I'm getting rid of that backpack permanently. That weight's going to be removed from my life. And when anxiety, when anxiousness starts to creep in, I realize all that means is, God, I have to start to depend upon you more because I believe that you're a good God. And I believe that you're in control and that you're watching out for me. And I choose this day to trust you. Let's pray together. God, I believe everything that I just stated. I believe that you're a good God. I believe that you care about the individual needs of your children. And that, God, because you're good and because I also believe the second thing, that you're 100% in control of the situation of, of our life that, that we're going through right now that's bringing anxiety and fear, God, because I believe that you're in control of that situation. I believe you're working these things together for my good even when I don't see it. And so, God, today I'm going to choose to put those things behind me. That the fear, that the anger, the depression that I face, the worry that I face, they don't have dominion over me. They have no control over me. For God, you're Lord of my life. And all those things in my life have to bow to who you are. God, I pray this morning for those that are battling anxiety. I pray for those that are battling fear. I pray for those that are battling worry. God, that you remove those things from their life. And when they start to creep in, as we want to pick up that backpack and put that worry back on us, God, I pray that they would have the strength to walk away from it permanently. God, for those who are really battling anxiety today, I pray that you'd remove anxiety from their life. God, I pray for whatever it is that ails them, whatever it is that holds them back. The anxiety, the fear, the depression, God, that all those things would, would cease. And that they get a spot where they rely entirely upon you. That the fear, that the worry, that the anxiety would succumb to prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. God, we love you. Believe that you're a good God. Work in our lives. Remove those things from us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.